So we are now in Systematic Theology, Lesson 1, Part 2. So we've already discussed why that we've called it Systematic Theology, and so we're still on Lesson 1, at least on my part, Lesson 1, I'm on Part 2. Brother Scott has Lesson 2 and Part 1, and he's going to be bringing Part 2 in the next session. And so that's how that we will do it. We will stagger them like that. You can just about depend on each one of the lessons having at least two, maybe three parts, depending on how long that it is. It's really a too long a session to, to have it all in one lesson. So we begin with part two on lesson one. To refresh our memories, in part one, we learned that doctrine is important. And not only is it important, it must be the right kind of doctrine or the right doctrine and not the wrong kind. So we'll continue part two in this particular lesson. We said that doctrine means teaching. All true preachers are teachers of the divine book. We preach and teach nothing new. If we do, then something's wrong somewhere. The form and the method may be different. But the teaching remains the same. The core teaching is the same. And don't let anyone kid you, there is nothing new in Scripture. There is nothing new to preach or teach. So if someone comes along with a new doctrine, then we, uh, we, we know what that is. All right, so we begin with question number eight. Did Jesus warn his disciples against doctrine of the chief religious sects of his day? Matthew chapter 16 and verse 11. How is it, Jesus is speaking here, that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Then understood they how he obeyed them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, Jesus had used a parable here, and Jesus used a lot of parables in his teaching so that actually the teaching could be simpler, at least to the disciples, but many times it wrecked havoc with the knowledge of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and they just didn't get it. Sometimes I wonder if Jesus didn't do that really on purpose so that they would not understand, Uh, but anyway... So the answer to that is, yes, he did. In these verses we've just read, Jesus very clearly warned the disciples about the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They understood what that false doctrine was. And once Jesus caused them to understand it, then they were able to combat it. You cannot combat something that you don't know anything about. You do not have to have an understanding about false doctrine. In other words, you do not have to study false doctrine in order to combat it. You can combat false doctrine by simply knowing and understand what true doctrine is. Now, I've used this illustration, and, and others have used it, and I suppose that it's still true today that bank tellers do not handle counterfeit money. They train using real greenbacks, if you will. That way, if a false or a counterfeit bill comes across their station, they can feel the difference. Now, that's the way that it used to be. I'm not sure if that's still part of their training. But you do not have to study and learn the wrong. You just have to study and learn the right. Because when you do that, then the wrong is going to be evident to you. You may not be able to pick exactly what the problem is. That's okay. But you will have a sense, something is wrong here. Something is off. This needs a second look. We need to look at this a little more in depth to find out what the problem is. Question number nine. Are the commandments of men sometimes preached for doctrine? Mark chapter 7, verse 7. How be it in vain do they worship me? Jesus again is speaking here. Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. The answer to this question is a resounding yes. 
The majority of doctrine that's preached and taught today is the false doctrine of the commandments and teaching of men. Now, I don't have any statistics, but I would dare say that anywhere from 95 to 99 percent of the teaching of in the religious world today is false doctrine. Because man doesn't like truth. Man in his unregenerated state does not love truth. If we love Jesus Christ and we love God as we should, then we're going to love his truth. And we're going to hate false doctrine. That yes, it's okay to hate the right things. We're not to hate people. That's not godly. We don't have to like them. There's nothing that says we have to like everybody. But we are to love our fellow man. We are not to hate him. Because hate is equivalent, if you will research it out and study it out, it's equivalent to murder. So we are not to hate anybody. But we are to hate false doctrine. We are to hate untruth. We are to hate heresy. So when we love God, as we should, then it should come automatically that we hate heresy and untruth as well. Number 10, are we warned against those who teach false doctrine? Romans chapter 16 and verse 17, Paul in his letter to the church at Rome said, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So the answer is absolutely. Jesus never said that we have to learn what the false doctrine was in order to stand against it or to fall for it. We simply have to know true doctrine in order to recognize it. And further, those that preach and teach false doctrine, as we mentioned before, do so for their own benefit. Now, our passages of scripture that we said, Paul said, mark them. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that we go up and we spray paint them with yellow paint or something. But we make sure that we pay attention to them because they are going to preach and teach false doctrine. And that was to be avoided in the Lord's churches. Number 11. Should we fellowship with those who teach false doctrine? Book of Second John, verse 10. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, Receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Dr. Albert Garner and his comments on these two verses from his Power Bible CD and his commentary had this to say. He said, if anyone should come to you of his own accord, in other words, uninvited or not vouched for, and brings along or does not hold this teaching. What is this teaching? This was the truth that John was referring to that was given by Jesus. And of course, as we know, the book of Second John was, was written by John the Beloved, we call him, one of the sons of thunder. All right? That Christ is come in the flesh and does not accept virgin birth. In other words, if somebody comes in and does not hold this teaching. And then he begins to explain that Christ has come into flesh, but does not accept the virgin birth. Do not take or receive such a person into your ace oikon house. Now, this ace oikon is actually church fellowship as the elect lady. John's not talking about our homes. What he's talking about is the church. God's children should not sanction in their fellowship an antichrist. 
Now, this is not necessarily what we're talking about in times Antichrist. This is someone who doesn't hold these doctrines that we've been talking about. They may have social fellowship, but not church fellowship with heretics. Some of the friends that I have, a good friend of mine is a Nazarene preacher. Well, we've had some good discussions before, but we remain friends. And he knows that I'm not going to change him. And uh, he knows that he's not going to change me. But boy, we love to discuss scriptures, especially where we differ. And I actually got him one time and he just had to shut up. He had no answer. That man is a very eloquent speaker and writer. He's an author. I haven't seen many people been able to put words together like he does. I mean, he do circles around me. And he was the wing chaplain when we were in Maine, and I was his deputy after I had been appointed a chaplain in the Civil Air Patrol. And so in a wing conference, he wasn't able to attend, but I did. He wrote out a prayer for the invocation. When the wing commander called on me to come up to do the invocation, I, I said, well, I said, our wing chaplain has written out an invocation. I said, those of you who know me know that I'm not this eloquent. Of course, everybody laughed, and most of them didn't know me. And so I, then I proceeded to read his prayer that he, that he had written out. On the doctrine of security of the believer, I got him. The end result of that was he didn't know how to answer what I had thrown back at him. So anyway. So, I mean, he and I, if you will, have fellowship together. Now, would I invite him to preach from a pulpit that uh, that I was responsible for? No, I wouldn't. He probably wouldn't understand that, and he probably would invite me to speak. I told a young man that worked with me in Jamaica, he and I had gone to one of the churches there. The pastor of the church, and this is one of the churches that, that we worked with, he invited a, I think he was a Pentecostal preacher, to preach. Well, that didn't go over too well, especially with me. And I told this young man who was my associate when we left, I said, let me tell you something. I said, I'm going to be pretty hard right here. I said, if you ever do anything like was pulled tonight, you and me are going to have some strong words. He says, I know, I understand that. <laughs> All right, question. What honor should be given to those who labor in word and doctrine? First Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Again, I want to quote from Dr. Albert's commentary on this passage, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verses 17 through 19. And I quote, The elders that rule or stand forth serve well. No single bishop or elder is ever singularly charged to, quote unquote, rule God's church, a local congregation. Bishops are overseers. Bishop is simply another word for pastor. But only a plurality of elders are to rule. Let be deemed, accounted, calculated, or computed worthy of double honor or double pay. Employed full-time ordained workers, not just merely pastors or, or bishops. Especially the ones, elders, mature, ordained brethren, whether deaconship or the bishopric, laboring in speech and teaching, those actually engaged, laboring full-time in preaching and teaching the system of faith of Jesus Christ. Full-time ordained employees of a church in whatever capacity they serve are to be paid as they labor in word and doctrine. For the scripture says, or asserts, equity and the scriptural principles require that churches that cares for worthy, needy, aged widows must also care for full-time church employees. An ox while threshing, thou shalt not muzzle him. That was an Old Testament commandment. Feed him if you work him. And to be sure that a hungry or starving ox was not worked, the law forbade covering his mouth with a muzzle. Financial religious stewardship equity was even required under Moses' law for the full-time support of full-time religious workers. 
And the workman is worthy of his pay or wages or remuneration for the work he does. Elders wholly given to the ministry of the word, whether pastor, missionary, devotee, or Bible teacher, like the firstborn in Israel, should receive a double portion, a two-share pay for time and service. Against an elder, a mature ordained brother in the church, do not accept, receive, or field an accusation or derogatory report. Do not become party to puffing up a scandal on the basis of rumors, whisperings, reports of talebearers. Except. Or unless it is on the word of two or three witnesses. The type of testamentary evidence from reputable witnesses required under law and sanctioned by Jesus Christ. Without such a reputation, the influence of the church and the reputation of her ordained brethren, all elders uh, in the church could be terribly scandalized. No, the world would love to do that. While every pastor is a bishop, such as a general overseer of a congregation, it appears that administrative church government was directed by all elders of the church, the ordained. A friend of mine, Brother David Smith, when he was a sponsoring pastor while I was in Jamaica, he had a, a retired businessman to draw up a administrative program for the church. And because the pastor... Brother David was spending so much time with the administration of the church that it was beginning to cut into his time of study and what he needed to do as a pastor. So he developed this plan where that all the administration of the church was overseen by what was titled directors of ministries, such as finance administration secretary of the church was was under and in charge of. There was the visitation director who oversaw all of the visitation of the church, the hospital visits and, and all of this kind of stuff, and so, so on and so forth. Uh, there was the director of missions. Now, these directors did not have, shall we say, power to dictate one thing or another. They were overseers. That also meant that they didn't necessarily have to do the work themselves, but they were overseers in getting that particular, whatever the area of responsibility that they had. And I use that. I've used that since. And it works very well because each director, if you will, for lack of a better term, was a servant of the church. And they answered to the church. When business meeting came along, then each director had a report to give to the church. So that way the pastor, even though he was, you know, the main overseer, he did not have to pay attention to the details of finance, to the details of visitation, to the details of uh, mission work and, you know, all of this kind of things. And if you recall, that's what happened in the church of Jerusalem. And that's why that they created deacons. Now, this church did not have enough deacons to do all of that, but that's okay. In any way that's not unscriptural on how a church wants to administer and take care of the business that she has to take care of and she's responsible for, that's okay, as long as it doesn't violate Scripture. So this is basically what is being talked about here in these passages of Scripture. In the church at Jerusalem, those deacons were appointed to take care of the physical needs of the church in Jerusalem. To take care of the administration, if you will. So often, many pastors are administrators, and they don't have time to pastor. All right, question number 13. Who are guaranteed to know the true doctrine? John chapter 7, verse 17. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. So the answer is quite simple. Those who follow the Lord's will know true doctrine. This is a conscious choice that a person must make. We cannot truly know the truth and correct doctrine unless we are doing the Father's will. And that's a requirement to know and understand the truth of God's word. All right, question number 14. What sort of doctrine should a preacher preach? Titus chapter 2, verse 1. 
Paul, in writing to the young preacher Titus, said, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, and not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. You have women as teachers. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. In other words, not back talking. Not forlorning, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of a great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Paul concludes the chapter by saying, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Now we see in this chapter that Paul wrote to the young preacher Titus all the things that Titus was to preach and teach. And a careful study of this chapter reveals to us that there is not a member type left out of this writing. When I say member type, I'm saying every member was covered. Aged men and women, the young, the young women, the young men. So all member types were, were included in this writing. So Titus, as the pastor, he had the responsibility to oversee teachings and doctrine that would feed and benefit the entire congregation. Now, I want to add something here. The pastor should not be the only teacher in the church. There should be other men and women that are capable and willing to teach alongside the pastor. Now, while the pastor has the overall responsibility of overseeing, just as he has the uh, responsibility of overseeing the administration of the church, that does not mean that he has to do it all. Shouldn't have to. You note that Paul gave instructions on how Titus was to conduct himself as a younger pastor. This chapter would be an excellent one to study in order to prepare oneself for the office of bishop or pastor. Because this chapter alone makes a great study on the ministry of a pastor. Then concluding this part of lesson one, we've seen the warnings of bad or false doctrine. We've seen that many times mankind will preach and teach his own doctrine in place of true Bible doctrine. We've been warned concerning these false doctrines, and there are so many today. We're not to have fellowship with those who hold to these doctrines or to encourage them in any way. Church fellowship. We've seen that we're to honor those who preach and teach true biblical doctrines. We've been shown that there is a guarantee that is available to those who would know sound doctrine. And then lastly, we've been shown how, what, and to whom the pastor is to proclaim true, sound doctrine. Biblical doctrine. 